art is a language of its own. Artists have to figure out how to take what's in their head or what they experience in the world and express it in a visual language. Sometimes that doesn't make it easier for us, the audience, to understand. That's why I'm here. Today we're looking at artists who aren't painting a landscape or taking a photograph. They're processing everything from cultural experience to artificial intelligence and even grieving loved ones. With every generation, there's this opportunity for evolution while still retaining authenticity. The AI used three-dimensional scans of all the hand imprints to understand what we do when we grasp a piece of clay. Our mortality is always kind of behind our shoulder. It's always following us, no matter what. I'm Amanda Paris, and this is CBC Arts Exhibitionists. <laughs> A person's tattoos can tell you a lot about them. They can also tell you a lot about the artist behind the needle. We've had a long fascination with tattoo artists here at CBC Arts, and so this year we're launching our new digital series, Art Hurts. It's where we introduce you to some of the most talented female identifying and gender non-binary artists in the industry. Today you'll meet Alona Fitty, who has translated her cultural heritage into art that people wear with pride. My name is Alona Fitty. I live in Toronto and I'm a tattoo artist. Tradition and culture is not static. You know, it doesn't just stay the same. It's, it's dynamic and it lives and breathes and changes with people and, and generations as times change. With every generation, there's this opportunity for evolution while still retaining authenticity. I'm a tattoo artist because I want to refer to these principles that are at the heart of our traditions. I specialize in hand poke tattooing. My tattoo work is mostly black and white, mostly illustrative uh, and graphic. It's very influenced by, you know, the culture and the music that I absorbed growing up. Some of it is, you know, very playful and some of it's kind of conceptual and weird and some of it is very spiritual and, and cultural and that part I take very seriously. Yeah, almost there. My interest in Filipino ancestral tattooing grew uh, from research for other mediums, like cultural or like diasporic-centered artwork. All my past work, like illustration, graphic design, installation art, all of it is very influential in my work now. This is just sort of like playing around with some things, I guess, like before I started to make like an overall piece. I'm sort of like starting to identify, I guess, the details that I like and that I wanted to like take from my influences and put them into, into tattooing. I'm half Filipino and half English. Both of my parents are very conservative, like regardless of where, you know, they're from. So they, they're both like, against, we're against like us getting tattoos. You know, if there's any kind of like common conception of tattoos being done by hand in North America. It has to do with um, jail tattoos or, you know, like like punk, kind of like kids like stick and poking each other. But yeah, it, like it is also interesting where, you know, for it to have started to be associated with criminals or for like little kids to think that it's like so rebellious to get it. To trace that back, it's like, there had to be a degradation in how we thought of it, of how we thought of tattoos first, because they used to be a part of pride and, and culture, and in a very integral way. I went to visit Wang Un, but but tribe, in February of this year, 2018. 
I've been wanting to go maybe for like eight or nine years. It definitely like deepened and strengthened that interest that had already been growing to just know that um, there were still people who were practicing their ancestral tattooing. There are 7,000 islands in the Philippines and tattooing used to be very common throughout a lot of, a lot of them in a lot of communities. You decorate and you adorn things of value and things uh, with purpose. It, it is an extension to, um, to decorate the skin. You know, the way that you, you decorate something to show that you value it, um, it's the same thing for, for your body. I grew up with people from all over the world, and that was just like my norm. Like that was normal. I understand more and more how lucky I was to grow up with so much like Filipino friends and family that I avoided a lot of um, cultural shame. That's a distinct and recurring storyline for you know for people. But it is important that Filipino culture has more representation and is respected and recognized for what it is because it is so beautiful and I, you know part of what I'm doing right now it's to just reclaim that pride to reclaim like a pride that we always had to question or aspire to something else to be accepted or to be good enough Hello, my name is Krisha Wright. I'm a multidisciplinary artist based out of Toronto, Ontario, and I'm your exhibitionist in residence this week. You'll be viewing a series of my pencil crayon and marker drawings, which experimented in hypersaturating the human skin tone. My work deals with questioning our indoctrinated beliefs of what femininity and blackness are, mythology, and issues surrounding mental health in the Afro-Caribbean community. I work primarily in oil paints. There are a lot of sci-fi themes taken from sci-fi film and a lot of anime influences as well. One of the biggest influences for me is probably Akira. So much so uh, that I named my cat after Tetsuo. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Coming up, we're meeting an AI with an artistic mind. Does the fact that an AI imagined the form of the work raise questions of authorship and, as a consequence, sentience? Recently, an artist named Jeff Koons got in some trouble. He got charged with using an idea from an ad campaign from the 1980s to create his own sculpture called Fait d'Hiver. And whether you care about Jeff Koons or not, it brings up a contentious term we hear a lot about, appropriation. I'm Professor Lees, not really a professor, and this is Art 101, not really a class. We're here to go on a deep dive of an idea, an artwork, or a story from the art world that's controversial, inexplicable, or just plain weird. Appropriation is a word that's been part of the conversation for a while, often in the context of cultural appropriation. But we're going to concentrate on the word appropriation itself. Is it bad? Good? Somewhere in the middle? And what does it actually mean? To appropriate something means to make or make use of without authority or right. And it's also a confusing topic because it's about stealing and ownership and originality. In music, you might think of appropriation as an act of respect. Sampling, remixes, old songs used to play a role in new ones. And that doesn't always go over well either. In visual art, it's been a tool, sometimes for good, sometimes for very critical reasons. Remember the picture of Barack Obama that filled hearts with optimism back in the days when we had optimism? That image of Obama came from a photograph by Manny Garcia. A street artist named Shepard Ferry took it, made it into a pop art looking pencil sketch, and put the word hope under it, and according to some, created an image that helped Obama win the election. Was it borrowing, theft, or paying respect? Appropriation has been a powerful tool for artists to shock our system. 
Canadian artist collective General Idea looked at the famous sculpture Love by Robert Indiana from the 1960s and turned it into their painting AIDS in 1987, an artwork that makes a visceral statement about love, fear, and the AIDS epidemic. Banksy has appropriated images from the news and from popular culture to talk about poverty, injustice, and the art world itself. Remember that Banksy piece that shredded itself at an auction a little while ago? That was an image he's appropriated from himself. It used to be called Balloon Girl, now it's called Love is in the Bin. And here's maybe the most powerful example from recent memory, Childish Gambino's This is America video. Donald Glover's poses go straight back to racist images of Jim Crow. He took on a despicable vision of a minstrel to enact a scathing critique of America in 2018. So, is appropriation a critical tool or a power move to steal somebody else's idea, culture, or artwork? Maybe it's both. It's still a confusing issue. It's still about theft, ownership, and originality. It's also been a powerful way for artists to make us think twice about things, provoke a critical point of view, maybe make us see things in a new way for a new future. Here's the Mona Lisa with a mustache because appropriation. Matt Chivers is a British artist who's really interested in the things that drive our thoughts and our actions. So in this video, he takes us through different ways we might experience the world through three different media. The first, through drawing. The second, through artificial intelligence, the thing that'll kill us all. And the third, through video. Take a look at this first person account of an artist translating what's in his head into our world. Migrations is the title of an exhibition presenting three related artworks. A sculptural installation, a two-part drawing, and a video work. The pair of drawings of a swallow, one made using my left hand, the other using my right. The swallow is a widespread bird species. Its annual passage between the northern and southern hemisphere was, and still is, a thing of wonder, leading to its association with the idea of transition between states of being. In a tradition dating back hundreds of years, before embarking on a voyage from which there was no certain return, mariners would be tattooed with a swallow on one side of their chest. On their return, another was tattooed on the opposite side. The drawings articulate the correspondence between the northern and southern hemispheres of the earth, the left and right hemispheres of the brain, and the action of thinking out through the body and into the world through engagement with materiality. Thousands of clay hand imprints have been used by an artificial intelligence to make its own imprint, sculpted into a stone called impactite. The AI used three-dimensional scans of all the hand imprints to understand what we do when we grasp a piece of clay. What comes out the end isn't just an average of the data, it's a new interpretation. The comparison with thinking and imagination is unavoidable. Does the fact that an AI imagined the form of the work raise questions of authorship and, as a consequence, sentience? Is there such a thing as an original idea or even individual consciousness? Linking back to the idea at the root of my practice, that the nature of reality is one of interrelatedness, where do our ideas come from in the first place? Data powers machine learning. The more data, the better. Information's fed into a program designed to complete a certain task. The program analyzes the data, learning from it to complete the job it's been given. Larev is a short film that imagines how our infatuation with technology may evolve. The film's form and content evolve from a dream. Because it's so personal, it allowed me to think more speculatively about how I see our evolution unfolding. I've used its focus on the senses, sensuality and the importance of meaning in our lives as a way of looking at what I feel to be some of the defining characteristics of what it is to be human. Lighthouses aid safe navigation by warning voyagers of hazards ahead. They remind us that we should proceed with full attention. Maybe what's most interesting about this moment of unprecedented technological change and evolutionary shift is the potential that it offers us to consider what it is about being human that we value. 
alluding to how we may be moving into a new way of being in the world because of the technologies that we're creating. Coming up, we meet an artist who has decided to embrace the one thing our society is most uncomfortable talking about, death. It's kind of unknown and sort of scary, so they kind of just put it away. This is me and my dad here when I was a babe. I think I was not even a year there. And then here's my dad when he was young. Love this picture of him so much. He looks so happy. Love it. And this is my mom and dad. My dad being a goofball, singing to my mom. And then this was the last picture of me and my mom when she was at my graduation. My name is Zef Mitchell and I am a collage artist. I choose collage because the art and the pictures and the illustrations that I find, I find a pleasure that it's almost like a treasure hunt. I'm looking for specific pieces. They inspire me in some sort of way. They instill some sort of feeling in me. When I kind of bring all these different pieces together to create this one piece that's my own, it, it just makes me feel, makes me feel good. It makes me feel happy. I actually use a lot of um, vintage piano sheet music as well in my art. So I always come here for that as well. And they always stack them all together. I recognize a lot of them. Um, my mom would, hum, whistle, or, or sing some of these songs, so I recognize a lot of them. Same with my dad. These are a, whole, a few of my originals, um, pieces that I bought from the Blue Jar Antique Mall and have used in my art. Um, they've actually let me bring it here and, and sell it here now, which is so, so cool. This piece here um, was an old piece of piano sheet music. The, one of the lyrics in this is, wherever you go, whatever you do, I want you to know. I'm following you. And it's kind of symbolic of just that our mortality is always kind of behind our shoulder. It's always following us no matter what. It's just a step away. I do have a lot of death um, imagery in my art. Um, because I have had a lot of loss in my life, I was 25 years old when my mom died. And the next day, it was my 26th birthday, and on that day I was, was when I became an orphan. My mom, dad, and both of my brothers had passed. So it was a lot of loss in like a uh, five year range, I lost my entire family, and I, you can't even put into words how I felt, or how I was supposed to feel, or how, what I was feeling at the time, because it was just so much. When I get a magazine, and I open it, of nostalgia just fills my room of just old vintage. It makes me think of my mom and dad and my brothers. My mom and I would go to the Wee Book Inn when I was younger, and just the smell of old books reminds me of my mom. And I just remember that smell, and when I'm flipping through those magazines, it just, it's just something that's comforting to me. I just learned this term from a friend, and it's called memento mori, which means remember death. And it's the actual practice of um, keeping your mortality to the forefront so you can kind of live your life to the fullest and kind of living, um, just living in the, kind of in the present at, at all times to kind of make you appreciate your life a little bit more. Our society views death as something that's taboo. It's kind of unknown and sort of scary, so they kind of just put it away. I've kind of just I've realized that death is something that people need to talk about and to kind of become more comfortable with, to kind of walk, almost like walk hand in hand with it because it's gonna to happen to all of us. 
And so that's one of the main reasons why I put it into my art, is to kind of almost create that discussion, um, to have that imagery. It has made me appreciate the people and the things and myself so much more. Just to not take anything for granted, nothing. To not take living for granted. I think my mom and dad would be very proud. I wish that they could be here to see what I've created. They might think it's a little b bizarre and weird, but it's me and I know they would be very proud. Recently, Zeph has started the journey of becoming a death doula, someone who provides support and assistance to help people cope with the process of dying. It's so moving how he's translating this intense experience of grief into both art and service to other people. I'm really inspired by the artist that we got to meet this episode because it's not easy to translate your experience into something other people can see and understand. If there's an artist you think should be on CBC Arts Exhibitionist, please let me know. Send me a message on social media. Our handle on all platforms is at CBC Arts. Tune in next week for another deep dive into the transformative work of Canadian artists. Peace. Thank you.